Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you are hopefully watching this. This is a verbal, visual uh, representation of my assignment, uh, draft assignment, uh, and it's done in this way, it will become more apparent during the conclusion. So if you hopefully watch all these videos together, there's four videos altogether, this is number one, um, at, in the conclusion, you will understand why I've used this format. Also, please stick with me, because right at the end, after my conclusion, I've got a really special guest star, my daughter, Madeline Feist Thompson, who is gonna actually help me do a mini experiment, and it's quite exciting, so please stay with me. So this is number video one in four. Okay, so, what is my assignment? Well, I decided to look at, so here comes the title of the assignment, can language within a social setting, a community, a group, and the way it is input into a developing child's mind, affect how that child thinks or has a thought? Also, can it also can it help the way they think about morality? Does it help them think about uh, society, the, the, their, their position within a social group, their position within a society, how they view others in society? So, so can the way language is input into a child within a specific social group, a culture or a community, affect the way the child thinks or has thought? Now you cannot go anywhere discussing or researching this without, of course, bumping into Mr. Lev Vygotsky. And we're gonna start with Lev because if it wasn't for Lev, I probably wouldn't be in this position. I'm very lucky to be in this position where I'm studying the MA for education. So thank you very much, Mr. Vygotsky. I studied it very basically, degree level, foundation degree level, and I found him absolutely fascinating. And he's where I'm gonna start. So language and thought and how it can affect children in regards to their social, cultural community. So let's look at Lev. So Lev believed that in a social perspective or cognitive linguistics, okay, he believed this. Here's a child with a developing mind and some knowledgeable other, some with more knowledge, more experience, could in fact use language, activity and physicality, symbols, to pass knowledge, to pass information down to that child, a more knowledgeable other. But how is this done? See, he, 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 he looked into it a step further. He said, imagine this. Imagine if you had a more knowledgeable other in a community, and here's a developing mind. Imagine if this person, let's call it a teacher, a more knowledgeable other, could use language, symbology, activities, not only to teach this developing mind, but also imagine if they were able to spot a moment when this developing learner, this mind, was suddenly getting the instructions and learning. So he came up with something called ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development. It's recognising this point of when the child's mind is linking things so cleverly together in here, you now step in and go, do you know what, it's at this point right now, I can give this child more information to bolster what they've already learned from me. Now he used another phrase, so imagine this, here's the teacher passing down the knowledge through language within the community, through action, through symbiology, the teacher recognises ZPD, quick. Now I can quickly give more information, but uh, let's do it carefully. Let's do it, let's do it with scaffolding. He called it scaffolding. And it's kind of nice, because if you think about a house that's being built from the foundation, you get to a certain level, and you, know, you don't want it crumbling or falling. You want to protect it. You want to protect it so you can get to the next level. So scaffolding. So what he's saying is, Careful how you input that information though. Think about how you got to this child, to this ZPD, this zone of proximal development. Now think about how you make sure you give them extra information in the correct way, in the correct language modes, 
that they're ready for within this, within their own culture, within their community, to ensure they do learn more and not crumble and fall back. So that's great. He then discussed this information, input, recognition of a ZPD, scaffolding to help them learn more, stop. The developing mind then has a what we call private speech, inner speech, where the mind would take the information and almost talk and teach to itself, the inner voice. Now, I've learned all this, and it, I'm speaking very basically, not in kind of, you know, probably professor or degree speak, and I apologise for that, but I want to make it simple because it's so simplistic, but in a way it's beautiful as well. Most information I gained on just explaining just that, those processes came from the following books. This one is called Thought and Language, led by Gotsky, uh, edited by Alex Kozulin, uh, newly revised, really good, I, I, I recommend this one. Um, and of course, led by Gotsky's Mind Society, a development of higher psychological processes. This one has been kind of dissed. I've been reading through lots of journals. This one got dissed a little bit. Um, but we'll come back to the reasons for that well, later on. But I, I use these two. And the other things that helped me come to this little conclusion, that little speech then, I, 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 get, I got some lot, lots of information from this one. So this is a great one. The concept of drama in Vygotsky's theory application in research it's one of the reasons why i'm doing this right now actually two i love this one because it opened up new words and new areas new genres to me um the anthropological underpinning of vygotsky's thinking the origins of his thinking <gasps> that was really good i love this one uh, number three you know about this one uh, metacognition and self-regulation in James Piaget and Vygotsky. So it was good because I could defer from both of those. So what I've said to you so far came from mainly the study of these and these ones here. So hang on a minute, let's get back to the point. So ZPD, scaffolding, inner voice. But who who's the inner voice? So this is where there's so much study being done on this. Um, who is the teacher? Who's the inner voice? What is this inner voice doing? How is it deconstructing and then reconstructing? If we've given them the information, we've recognised the zone of proximal development, here's the time they're about to learn, scaffold it quickly and then let them process it themselves. What is that process? What is the teaching in here? Here come the 1960s, a lot happened in the 60s, and a gentleman called Noam, Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky. And he basically said, guess what? I, I believe, through all my studies, that that inner voice bit is actually called something I'm going to call LAD, LAD. Language Acquisition Device. A device within the brain that's always been there that can acquire language, decipher it, manoeuvre it grammatically and put it into sentences and then question itself and that is amazing he is suggesting a genetic feature a natural feature within the brain that's developed through language this journal refers to this this is called uh, language evolution constraints and opportunities from modern genetics now i don't want to get into a debate about religion um, it's not about beliefs, this is just about me re researching. But here is a study that suggests that there is parts of the brain that since language began and has an our language is split into, there's like 7,000 different languages on our planet. But because of this and how within languages, different languages, and because of how the language is used, which promotes a thought or types of thought, how that has now helped the brain develop in certain ways and there are parts of the brains that are evolving changing adapting in regards to language acquisition this is a great little journal and another one that came up 
was this one. Now this is Vygotsky meets neuroscience. The cerebellum and the rise of the culture through play. Also talks about possible genetics. So let's go back to so Vygotsky and his theories. Chomsky comes along because you know that inner voice, I think it's this LAD. It's something within the brain that's already there. Something that helps us acquire language, reproduce it, put it together, construct, and help us think and have a thought, link thoughts. In fact, Chomsky himself actually states this. Now, I've got it written down here. In July 16, 2016, last year, in the University of Arizona, uh, during um, an interview, he actually said this. This is his words. Language did not evolve for communication alone, but more to be able to express a thought. Now that, that literally blows my mind. So that's like, I imagine, the first human, and they have these strange emotions, things, visuals, connections happening within the brain. It's been so frustrating. And obviously maybe one of the ways they got this out was trying to reproduce what was going on here onto paintings, uh, drawings, and then imagine this, making a sound, because all language is, all a word is, is a bunch of words and clicks and I breathe out my diaphragm and I've got like pressure waves that go through the air that go in people's ears and we, now, we can deconstruct those and put it into words and then reconstruct the words and form sentences and help us think about other things. So we have ideas, ideas are put, thoughts are put into us to help us think about other things. So he's saying, yeah, I reckon language was evolved because we had to, to get these thoughts out of our head and share these thoughts. And that's how, as we shared thoughts, it developed more thoughts and so on and so on and so on. Now, I've also got a lot of information from this great little book, um, Noam Chomsky, Language and Thought. And I can't believe I did this, but I actually emailed Noam Chomsky himself at the University of Arizona, and he actually replied. So, thank you so much, Mr. Chomsky, for replying. And he did give me some valuable feedback on this, which I can show you at a later date. Now, here's the other thing. So we have this amazing Lev Vygotsky talking about mind and society, thought and language, then Chomsky leading him with the LAD and this possibility of a, a language acquisition device that can take in information in language in certain ways and then we can think about things and reproduce thought. And then you get another person, because this happens now, language erupts all over the world. I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Language just explodes. So not only do we now have languages within cultures that are different, but we know within languages have different accents, different tones of language. A word, now, words can suggest emotion make you feel, make you feel angry, make you feel happy, make you feel sad by just saying a word. Certain words can make you erupt in anger. So now we've changed the way we use language to promote feelings. And that's when another gentleman called Lebov comes into the scene. This is great stuff. So, here we go. Lebov. He's taken it even further. He said, you know what, yeah, we can teach children through language, we can learn through language and actions, but there's so many different languages now. You know, it would be quite hard, for example, for me, I don't speak a word of French, if someone was about to come in now and teach me how to make mashed potato, that I've never made for in my life, but only speak to me in French, I would find that hard. Because Number one, I, w I wouldn't know a word what they were saying to me because I don't speak French. Number two, I might 
not pick up on the way they're saying, the tone of their saying, I might find it quite aggressive the way they're speaking to me because they don't get me. So there might be a clash now of learning because I don't understand his language, I don't understand his culture or her culture. So the Bob said this, do you know what? This can happen. Not just with totally different languages you don't understand, but what happens within languages you do understand, but there's accents. There's accents to language. He did an amazing study about how accents affect how we learn and communicate. And it was done in Macy's. And basically, he went into Macy's. This is his project. Big store in New York, Macy's. And the idea he had was this. I wonder now that in society, we've got all these languages, but now we have accents, uh, dialect within languages. I wonder if some accents or language, uh, sorry, so some accents of dialects have been put above others. Now, what I mean by that, I mean socially. I mean, well, I'll just tell you what he did. It's amazing. So he went into Macy's store and he wanted to go to, I think it was the lingerie floor. And he went into the lift and he said to the person working the lift, because the other person who took the lift up and down, he said, um, I want to go to the lingerie floor. What floor is it on? And in a typical New York accent, this is going to sound so bad, the uh, person said, fourth floor, to which William LeBoff said, I beg your pardon, what floor? And the New Yorker with his accent said, fourth floor, to which LeBoff said again, I do beg your pardon, what floor? He purposely spoke in a what we call eloquent uh, he pronounced his words straight away after the third time not straight so the third time the attendant in the lift dropped their accent that they've been brought up within and said in a clear defined voice fourth floor now that says a lot to me already that person within that lift stepped out of their cultural language and almost demeaned themselves to say, oh crumbs, yeah, I'm not speaking properly. I better speak properly for this p person to understand. So that's that's throwing in another thing there. That's throwing in that within our society, do know we not just have languages, we have we have priorities, a prestige of linguistics. A prestige of linguistics. We have to understand this, because if that's true, we may have children growing up who have accents because they're from certain areas who see themselves as lower or lower intellect than people with other accents. So this that that was a that was a, a really love not lovely find. And here's some of the some of the lovely um, things I found it. And here's a great one. This was brilliant. Here it is. So the impact of Lebov's contribution to general linguistic theory. <sighs> William Lebov, absolutely brilliant. And then this one as well, very interesting. An exploration of sense of community part three, dimensions and predictors of psychological sense of community in geographical communities. Really good, really good. And this is another one. Uh, yeah, this is, <laughs> yeah. This is brilliant. This comes banger up to date. Beyond genre. Systematically framing Lady Gaga in the dynamics of pop culture. It's true. You know, we've got, we've got, there's different languages. There's, uh, there's we had graffiti artists now who use symbolization to communicate in a totally different way that I wouldn't understand because it's a different culture. It's a different language, a different format. So this, this is amazing. This, it, this is saying to me that, yeah, actually, we do have a situation where language and the way language is said within communities or social aspects or social cultural um, areas can affect the way children are starting to think about everything in life. Everything. So, after Lebov and, of course, Lebov, uh, uh, Chomsky and Vygotsky. I came across Bruner, obviously, but I did come across Bruner 
uh, quite a long time ago via uh, Vygotsky. Bruner came up with a classic. Here's a little quote from Bruner. Nature of language as a cultural communication tool and the study of cultural contact specific purposes. This includes the exploration of outside groups creating cultural and language changes. Okay. Things like a... I even said it. Did you hear that? I changed my voice. I just done it then. I spoke like I thought how a professor would speak. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so he's now saying, you know, Bruno was saying, well, yeah, you can get this culture and this culture come together. It could bind. It could come together. The language could change because those two cultures come together. Or one could systematically take over the language of this culture and make it completely different. That's amazing. And, and, and change the way they think. And change the way they think. So hang on a minute. There's something else I just want to speak about because I've got it. I've got it written down here. Um, when we talked about earlier, we said about something about anthropology of language. So there, there, that means it's true then. So there is a what we call a familial anthropology of language, the economic anthropology of language, the political anthropology of language, the symbology or symbolic anthropology of language, and of course, thought and art through language. So hang on a minute. We're saying a child can, a developing brain of a child, according to the language within the familiar, the social group, the closest one, its economic status now within our world, political views of maybe the parents and religious views, symbology, and maybe how the parent has thoughts on maybe education, art, the world around them, is completely pushed upon that child within their brain. It's there. We're forming them. You know, it's almost like we always say, and I heard this quote in a, in a really beautiful film I watched recently called Collateral Beauty. And this quote was this. We often say as humans, children's, children come from us, but actually they go through us. And what I mean by that is every action we have upon them, from what I'm learning here, has an absolute impact, especially in here, everything. Just as an example, I wanna to go to um, talking about different cultures and cultures that are expanding now different different cultures that are expanding now uh, I, I came across a, a brilliant lady called Mimi Iota Mimi I-O-T-O Ioto. sorry I do apologize and she did a, a, a talk at University of California in 2016 and the title was this is so cool geeking out and leveling up and basically she did a whole talk on how gamers so you've got these gamers now you play games for hours and hours on end and they basically formed their own community and so they could learn how to um, solve the problems and win at these games they formed their own kind of language within this computer community themselves to solve the problems and to solve the games because they wanted to get to the next level that's 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 happening now we should embrace that as well. I mean, a lot of people uh, say, you know, computers, woo, that's a new language. It's, it's huge, but that's a different, sorry, that's a different assignment. Um, and do you know what, just to come full circle, whilst I was doing all my study, uh, I came across a talk by a lady called Leah Broditsky, Leah Broditsky, uh, University of San Diego, 2016, and she did a talk on how language we speak shape the way we think and she talked about the Hopi tribe which I know Worf and Sapir did a lot of uh, uh, stuff with this and this is great the Hopi tribe had no concept in their language get ready for this of time in their tribe we we speak of time past present now future Within their language, they have no concept of time. 
Therefore, how I wonder how their thought process, I wonder what they think, how they think, how they see the world. They see it, or must see it, so different from us and our culture because of the language we produce. Taking a step even further, Professor Jan Havlan, once again of San Diego University, and he did his studies in navigational science and he used tribes who get this. They have no concept of themselves as the center point in their speech or in the environment. This is what I mean by this. If I now said, oh look, my right leg is on fire. I've just gone, I pointed to my right leg and I've said right leg and it's my, my right leg within this environment is on fire. They would say a totally different thing. They would actually say, oh, the leg southwest of the large tree by the lake that I've lived all my life is on fire. That means this tribe does not put themselves at the center of their universe, of their language, of their thinking. Now that could possibly mean they have more affinity with their environment. They have to be, because they can navigate without a compass. They've learned to be such a part of their environment, within their language, that they could literally stand within their environment and tell you we're north, east, south, west, and all the other directions on the compass was because of the language they use. And that's the way their brain has developed. With all this in mind, taking all this together, and all my other studies that I've done, oh, and, and just everything from these journals, which have been absolutely amazing, by the way, I have come to a conclusion. So what is my conclusion with all this? So my original question was, you know, can language within a social group, a community or a culture, and the way it's perceived to those tremendous the actions, shape the way they think? My conclusion, this is a very base study. I would love to study this more. I wish I could get paid to do this. This is brilliant, but I can't. So I've got to come to a conclusion. I believe that there is an impact. I believe that you know you become yourself through others. You know you learn things, different languages, how the language is spoken to you, um, sim symbols within the cultures that you've been brought up within. Uh, I, I do believe it has an impact. And with my job uh, being um, an educator, I hope I can say that. Yeah, I'm an educator. I think this is so so important. Uh, we need to look at how we educate children. I'm going to certainly look at how I educate and interact with children completely now. It's almost like as if before I even think about trying to communicate with that child, I need to understand, hang on, you know, what is their culture? What community, what is, what is going on within their community? What are their likes? What are their dislikes? Who are these children? How do I speak to them? Am I speaking in the right language? I'm going to even I'm think about my tone and my voice, my accent, for goodness sake. I'm a Plymovian who has luckily lost a bit of my Plymovian accent. No offence to any Plymovians watching this. But I've done that because I, want, I thought, I literally thought I, I, I sounded less intelligent. I probably don't sound that intelligent now. So I believe the format of education should change as well. We, we, we do create a community. We create a culture in a school. We have this building, this thing, and we ask different human children from all over the place to come from different cultures, different communities, different likes, different dislikes, into one building that, you know, we have created. We create the curriculum. We create the culture. We create the language within there. And actually, let's stop and think. Before we create the culture, the community, and the language, let's think about all the children that are coming in there first of all and make sure it's broad and diverse enough for all of them. Now I'm gonna show you a couple um, journals that uh, has helped me come to my conclusion. Uh, the first one in regards to education was this one. 
uh, understanding Vygotsky for the classroom, is it too late? It does speak a lot about this book here, I'm going to refer back to this one, and how people have almost like just um, read through it, taken some of the ideas, but not applied everything. And also, don't forget, this gentleman died quite early, and still some of his ideas in psychology and education and, and teaching and psychological processes have not been translated properly or deeply enough. That's what this is suggesting, and it's suggesting that some people are trying to use these theories but not use them correctly. I think that could be the case. So this is a great, great little one. Uh, also came, this one is really, really good. A plea for a social cognitive perspective on the language, cultures, cognition, nexus, and educational approaches to intellectual communication competence, which is what I was trying to say here. This is how we communicate with those children. Let's, let's really consider the language and the culture and how we're saying this language and how we approach the child with everything, visually, body language, language, the words, everything. Uh, uh, in, in regards to the format of education, um, this, is, this is another little um, translating social motivation into action. Brilliant. Contributions of need for approval to children's social engagements. You know, get them more involved. Because a school should be the hub of a community. It shouldn't be a different community. It should be part of the community of where those children live. Hence why I always talk about something called the community classroom. Not just in here, it's there. It's everywhere. And another one that I came across, um, oh, which is this one here. Uh, can language... <laughs> It's brilliant. Can language prime culture in Hispanics? The differential impact of self controls in uh, controls. Sorry, in predicting intention to use a condom. So using their culture, literally understanding the language and their culture first of all, everything the symbology, symbology. Sorry, of their language and culture, and then writing a program for that first of all. Not saying let's get them bring them into our culture and the way we teach. No, no, no. Going to their culture, learning about the culture, their community, their language, and putting the program and curriculum to them. Very good. Why have I given my assignment to you in this format? My draft of this assignment in this format? Myself, as a person learning, I have struggled over the years. It wasn't until the age of 21 that I found out that I had a form of dyslexia called Rivers Dyslexia. It hasn't held me back, but it does hinder me. When I'm doing uh, work, degree level work, you have a format that you look for, you have a culture, the whole university system has a culture of learning and how things are done, and you have your own language, and it's how you write a dissertation or an assignment. The instructions are there. I struggle with the language you asked me to write in. I struggle with trying to understand that. This is how I communicate best. Sometimes as well, when I'm trying to write and trying to write in your speak, the universal, university speak, or degree level speak, or MA level speak, I actually stop my thinking process. My thought process doesn't happen. Here, hearing myself, and my voice helps me immensely. I'm going to say something to you right now, which might sound quite strange. I don't know if this is relevant. When I try and read quietly, and I used to get told off for this at school, I cannot hear a voice in my head. That might sound strange to you, but I, if I try reading quietly, I cannot hear the voice in my head. When I speak, I hear my voice. Therefore, I'm hearing a language which is helping me think and link. Probably what Chomsky was referring to is you know grammatically maneuvering different things which help me link up to different areas I don't know you might come back to me and say Carl this isn't you cannot do this but I'm asking you I struggle with putting all of this onto paper and I wouldn't have come to the conclusions that I've come to if I did it that way I make notes which looks like a spider has gone across a page but are they legible? Probably not. So is this showing you that I don't research as much as I would if I did write it down? 
I don't know. That's for you to make the decision. What I would love to do now though, is so that you know that I have learnt, read, taken all this in, I would like to do a very special experiment with a very, very, very special little human being I would like to introduce to you right now. And her name is Madeline Feiss Thompson. Here she is, I'm gonna get her covered. Hello, Maddie. This is my daughter. Can you say hello? Hello. Can you tell me your name? Maddie. How old are you? Seven. What school do you go to? Luke Junior. Ooh, that's <laughs> nice for you. Yeah. Now, Maddie's gonna do something amazing for me. Um, I'm gonna use all the stuff I've learnt in how we communicate to try and teach Maddie a brand new word, brand new word, she's never heard it before. And, and also, I'm gonna let Maddie, this is amazing Maddie, you ready? Not only is she gonna learn the word, I'm gonna let her brain in the side here, in there, um, have its own little kind of inner speech, inner thought, and she's gonna come up with her own thinking about the word. So this might not work, but let's just see. Shall we have a go? Give us a high five. Okay, so Maddie, what I want you to do, I've written a big word on this page, on these pages, sorry. Now I had some blue tack here somewhere, Maddie, but I don't know where it's gone. Do you know where my blue tack's gone, my friend? I don't know, oh, you found it, here we go. So Maddie, are you ready for this? Yes. So here we go, Maddie. I'm gonna stick this word up on the ball on the wall, is that all right? You sure about this? Okay, now Maddie, I am obviously your father. Now I know Maddie very well. I know Maddie very well. And I know what things she likes. I know something about her culture. She likes surfing. She likes being funny. <laughs> As you can see, she loves songs. She loves stories. She loves stories. So I'm gonna use my background knowledge of all the stuff that she loves and communicate to her in that genre. If that makes sense, I'm going to communicate to her in that genre. No, Madeline. Uh-huh. Madeline, young lady. Stand back and come here. Madeline, have you ever seen this word before? No. She's never seen this word before. Are you sure about this? Yeah. Okay, Madeline, we're going to read the word. Is that okay? I'm not going to tell you what it says. See if you can read it first of all. Hi. That is pretty good. Check this out. Hypo thermia. Say hypothermia. 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 <laughs> hypothermia. Say hypothermia. Hypothermia. Say hypothermia. 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 Right, now listen. It's a big word, isn't it? Yes. Should we break it apart a bit? I love doing this, Maddie. Do you love doing this? Yeah. Tell me you say, I love doing this now. I love doing this. Thanks, Maddie. Right, watch this. So I'm gonna break it apart, Matt. yeah? Into three different words. Oh! Hypo. Hypo. Therm. Ear. Ear. Hypo. Therm. Ear. Ear. Check this out. This one. Now, Maddie, you know you love learning about kind of doctors and nurses and paramedics. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes you say to me, Dad, Dad, I want to work at Morrison's on the till. And sometimes you no, I want to be a surgeon and fix people's brains. You can be anything you want, okay? But you know those doctors, those paramedics, all those nurses, they use these massive words. This is actually, it's a big medical word that they use in hospitals. But I'm going to teach you it. This is how massive your brain is. This is how brilliant your brain is. Let's look at this word first. Say hypo. Hypo. Go like this, go. Hypo. Hypo. Means low. Means low. Say hypo. Hypo. Oh, no. Means low. Means low. Stand up. Say hypo. Hypo. Means low. Means low. It just means something's very low. It could mean that if I haven't got enough maybe food in my tummy, <laughs> it's quite low on food. So it's quite hypo. Say low. Low. Say that's low. Low. What I want you to do now, Maddie, is take this pen and write low on there. Low. Low. What, what does hypo mean? Low. What does it mean? Low. Excellent. New word. Next word. Say 
firm. Firm. Have I you? Feel firm. Oh, nearly. Have you ever seen mm -hmm. at school a thermometer? No. Yes. That's that's not unusual, at you might think. <laughs> now a thermometer mm -hmm. is pretty cool. It's kind of like this. I'm going to draw you an image. Okay, I'm going to draw you an image. Now, it's, like a, it's like a glass thing and it's got loads of liquid in here. It's got loads oh, of numbers you put on it. it. In here when you're doing oh, it now. Uh, hang on. ZPD, ZPD, ZPD. <laughs> scaffold, scaffold. <laughs> so just explain what you said it was again. What do you do with it? You put it in your mouth when you don't feel like it. It's one of those <clears> things. And what can it do? It tells you your hot temperature. Your what did you just say then? Hotness. Excuse me a minute. <laughs> so hang on. Check this out. Thermometer, therm. Thermometer, therm. It means temperature. This means temperature. Do you want to write temperature? Yes. Temp. 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 Temperature. temperature. You see, the thing is, you also get something, Maddie, called a, say, thermal hat. Thermal hat. And that keeps you nice and warm. You can also get, let's put them on, thermal socks. Thermal socks. Or thermal gloves. Thermal gloves. You can even get thermal pants. Thermal pants. <laughs> Therm temperature. Temperature. Woo! Hypo means? No. Therm means? Temperature. Oh my word! No. Oh, ear. Say ear. Ear. This is a tricky one, Please maybe. Hi. Well, nearly. <clears throat> there is something called, can you say this? Say, anemia. Anemia. Say, what's anemia, Dad? What's anemia, Dad? Well, anemia, sometimes, you know the blood in your body that runs around everywhere? If you haven't got a lot of the blood in your body, you go really white really white and we can call it anemia say anemia anemia so you know like casper the ghost he's really white isn't he say oh anemia casper anemia casper you know if a baboon with its big red butt <laughs> you know a baboon with its big red butt if all the blood went it would go a bit white say oh anemia in that baboon's butt anemia in that baboon's butt say anemia Anemia. So anemia, we could say that ear means, what's this Maddie? What? Blood. So hang on, low temperature. Blood. Hang on a minute. Low temperature blood. Wait a minute. So hang on, hypothermia means you've got low temperature blood. Talk, look at that camera. Listen to this. <clears throat> Hypothermia means you have low temperature blood. What? Hang on a minute, excuse me. <laughs> you just blow my mind, man. Are you telling me that hypo. Let's put it together. Hypothermia would be low temperature blood. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute, Manny. Let's put it all together. Hi, both. So hang on. LAD, gr massive grammatical manoeuvres going on here. Chomsky. Right. Say that again to the camera, please. Hypothermia means low temperature blood. So you have low temperature in your blood, so your blood is quite low. If you have low temperature of your blood, low temperature, what's a low temperature, Maddie? It means that you are a bit okay. Now. If you've got high temperature, you are... Hot. If you've got low temperature, you might be... Okay, cold. Oh! Hang on a minute. If you've got low temperature of blood, then it your blood is cold. very... Cold. Hang on a minute. Are you telling me that... Hypothermia means that your blood is cold. Yeah. <gasps> when you're cold, your blood gets cold. 
LAD now, Language Acquisition Device. Check this out, and this is thought. She's going to create a thought. Uh, Maddie, I just want you to think about this word for me, my, my handsome. Look at me, my friend. Can you find? Oh, yeah. Good little turn around. Little boogie. I want you now to use your amazing brain for something now. Hypothermia, low temperature of blood, means your blood's cold. I want you to think of something, Maddie, that would make the blood in your body, don't say it straight away, become really, really cold. What would happen to you to make you get hypothermia, really low temperature of blood? Just have a think. Close your eyes. What on earth? So Maddie's learnt this word, she's taken in the word, she broke the word down with my language that I use in a specific way. She is now maneuver, grammatically manoeuvring all these words together and she's thinking now, what could cause this? The court, she's having a thought. Write it all down Maddie for me. May I sit down Maddie? Yes. Maddie? Can you, so, what is that word up there? Hypothermia, Which low means temperature what? blood. So what, that mean, what does that mean, your blood is a very, very... Cold. Right, here's what Maddie's brain, I haven't told her, she's never seen this word before, so this is the thought process. She's put this word together with other words, linked with experiences in her life. And the, the ways you could get hypothermia, low temperature of blood, and could you read them out? Snow, cold, rain and wind. <laughs> Give them the thumbs up. ZPD, scaffolding, more knowledgeable are there. Now we're talking about Chomsky's theories. Anne the Bobs, the way I spoke to her, my mannerisms, the culture, language. Maddie? Thanks very much. Okay. Say goodbye to the camera. Bye. Bye.